Sandra, good morning to everyone uh, dialing in today. Uh, from where I am in Seremban, the weather looks really good, right? Uh, so I take that as a good sign that today's session would be even livelier than uh, the ones previously. All right. So uh, with us today, we have uh, three uh, panel members, very venerable. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Mr. Sun Sang, CEO of uh, Teach for Malaysia. And we have Mr. Mahmoud Hisham, uh, Vice President of Dale Carnegie, and also Harvina Olik, uh, Ms. Harvina Olik, uh, co-lead of Lean in Youth. Uh, and with us today, as usual, uh, the ever energetic Rauda Nazran, uh, who'll be a, a who will be our moderator for the session today. And of course, our CEO, Ponsherin Shariza Abdul Ghani. All right, so uh, today's, uh, as you can see in the background uh, behind us, uh, today's a Medeka special. We're going to celebrate all um, the spirit of uh, independence, uh, especially among the youth of the country. Right, so hence the title Youth Empowerment in Nation Building and Eradication of Poverty. So, um, without further ado, perhaps I would like to invite uh, Puan Shireen to uh, kind of give her welcoming remarks. If Silakan, Puan. Thank you, Fauzo. Fau. Uh, good morning, everyone. Salam alaikum, salam sejahtera. Good morning, fellow panelists. And of course, all of you have dialed in today on a Saturday morning. Pau is right. Where I am in uh, the area, in Tamantun, Sungai Penchala, it's also bright and sunny. So, you know, um, so everybody is in a reasonably great mood, uh, I hope. Uh, and and uh, the engagement will be uh, quite interesting uh, coming uh, going forward. Uh, so thank you. Um, and we're happy to actually now today uh, share with you the next uh, the, the uh, series um, of our uh, our IDEP conference. And um, you know today is very special as Pao has said. And um, yesterday we were talking about uh, what Madeka meant. Uh, and you know it's about rejoicing and remembrance. Rejoicing the fact that we live in a country that's relatively peace and and you know peaceful and and people are getting along. Uh, remembrance also to to sort of give thanks uh, to our founding fathers, uh, who who you know uh, put this uh, built this nation and all of us in our contribution. So uh, I'm I'm really pleased to be part of this session because I think it's super special. Sometimes I'm lost of words, uh, just thinking about how, what, what the significance of the Merdeka is to all of us, especially today. So um, welcome and thank you. Uh, we're happy to, to uh, host this for you. And as you know, Sjatra is a, uh, you know, uh, an NGO and a nonprofit that's focusing on um, poverty eradication, looking at low income groups, um, looking at different kind of modes that we roll out to uh, build sustainable communities. So um, it's been, what, 12 years already of ESS yes, Jatra, and uh, we're building and moving uh, forward uh, with our agenda. And one day, I think our aim is to make ESS yes, Jatra uh, uh, a part of history, because then we would have done our job. Uh, so that remains our focus and remains our aspiration. And uh, you know, and with all, all the panel this morning, the the young ones and the young at heart, um, I think we're on, on the right path. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Pancharin, for your welcoming remarks. Um, perhaps it be, uh, it'd be good if you can take some time to uh, watch uh, a Sujatra introductory video. Um, May I request uh, Shah or Harris to share it with us? Thank you, please.
there you have it. So um, without further ado, um, I'll pass it on to our moderator, Rauda Nazran, uh, to kickstart the panel session. Floor is yours, Rauda. Super, thank you, Paris, so very much for passing the baton to me. Hi, everybody, a very good morning. Happy Saturday. I hope everyone's doing well. Welcome back. Um, if you've been following us since the first webinar, welcome back to yet another Yes and Stratus webinar. For today, we've got a really, really interesting topic, um, a topic that I really love to talk about, given that I'm a 25-year-old youth as well. So I've got a lot to talk about, and I'm sure all the panelists have got a lot to talk about as well. So the topic that we will be um, unraveled, uh, we will be unraveling today would be youth empowerment in nation building and uh, eradication of poverty. And I believe it's a topic that um, is timely for us all to talk about, especially in terms of youth involvement, uh, as well as youth engagement in the country. Now, to those of you who have been tuning in since the first one, you know me. To those of you who's a first timer, my name is Raja Nazran and I will be your moderator for today. Now, I am just a bit of introduction about myself. I am the CEO of Accelerate Global. It is a social enterprise aimed at tackling youth unemployment issues, especially amongst the underprivileged and, and the marginalized in order to tackle youth unemployment. Now, um, today is not about me. Obviously, we've got uh, four amazing panelists today to talk about um, youth empowerment as uh, Pao already introduced them. Now, um, in order to kickstart the whole session, I actually thought of asking um, a question, and that is, what exactly is youth empowerment? I believe everyone has got a different definition of youth empowerment. For me, for instance, my definition of youth empowerment is empowering the youths uh, in order for them to become independent, self-sufficient and resilient individuals in order for them to be able to move the nation forward. But that's me. Now, I want to open the floor to the panelists to perhaps give us a little bit of a taste about what you think youth empowerment is all about and perhaps what you've done um, to, to mobilize the agenda of youth empowerment. Shall I start with um, Sun Seng? Sure, thanks so much, Rada. And it's really great to be with everybody here this morning. So, you know, at, at Teach from Malaysia, we, we really believe that education uh, is a key to empowerment and, and not just education, right, but quality education. And, and our aspiration is that every child in Malaysia, no matter what background they're from, whether they come from a high income or a low income background, whether they are born into um, an urban city or into the most rural part of the country, that they would have access to a quality education, because we believe that that is absolutely key uh, for empowerment. But what, what does that mean, right? And I think, like, Rada, you said that we might have different definitions, but I think they're probably all going to overlap in some uh, way or form. So at Teach from Malaysia, our vision for students is that we want to see a Malaysia where all children are empowered to be leaders of their own learning, their individual future, as well as the future of Malaysia. And, and what that means is that we want to, we want to see students that have a voice, um, that are able to, to have an opinion and share that opinion and make that, uh, make that opinion um, known to others. Uh, students or, or young Malaysians that have the values um, that will allow them to drive their future and this nation forward. And you know, when we think about Merdeka and we think about the spirit of that, that's a huge part of the values that are important to, to us as Malaysians. Um, and finally, having the capability. Um, so do they actually have the skills, um, the knowledge, the skills uh, to be able to pursue um, the kind of future that they want for themselves as well as the future that they want uh, for the country. So Teach from Malaysia, uh, we, we really focus on ensuring that we are playing our part uh, in bringing in um, you know, who we hope to be some of the most promising future leaders of this nation to serve as teachers in some of the most high need communities and schools across the country. And uh, we call them our fellows. So our fellows come in and they teach for two years as full time teachers with the Ministry of Education um, in some of the most uh, challenging really uh, schools um, in the country. And they work towards this vision of through education, empowering students to be able to be leaders of themselves, their communities, as well as the nation. So I'll, I'll pause there. 
Super. Soon thing. I think that's a really good start. I really love how you mentioned that, you know, the vision is to have youth as well actually able to voice out their opinion. And I think that's, that really matters, especially when we talk about Mordeca, as you mentioned, you know, it's Independence Day. And in, back then in 1957, that was how it happened because, you know, our forefathers actually had a voice and voiced it out, the need of actually having Malaysia as an independent um, state. So thank you, Soon Singh. Now, I wanted to pass on to Mahmoud and Harvina. Do you both share the same thinking um, that Sensing has in regards to youth empowerment and the definition of youth empowerment? Um, Arina? Oh, <laughs> hi, hi, Rada. So uh, I think that, uh, so like what Chun, uh, Chun Sing, um, uh, Sun Sing uh, mentioned, there is definitely going to be some uh, overlap between everyone's definition of youth empowerment. So for example, at Lean in Youth, uh, we believe in educating, enabling, and empowering youths in universities to discover, build, uh, discover, build, and uh, to discover and build their potential to become change makers towards a more equal world. So, how we do this basically is to conduct uh, workshops, and, uh, workshops and masterclasses, and forming partnerships with universities and companies uh, and student groups. To try uh, to to encourage uh, uh, these university students to harness their potential towards becoming future leaders uh, in their community and to to effect positive change towards creating a more equal uh, a, a more equal world. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of what we do is uh, a lot of what we do is very similar uh, 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 with uh, with. Uh, uh, with Sun Singh's definition of uh, 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 youth empowerment, which is to, to create uh, future leaders who are, who are capable of affecting positive, serious and positive change uh, uh, within, the, within their, their communities and within this country. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Yes, definitely. There's, there is an overlap. I think when we talk about empowerment, uh, empowerment means, you know, being able to stand on your own two feet, being independent, having a voice, uh, being able to go out there and actually pursue your dreams, right? I love it. Now, having said that, because I think you mentioned um, something really crucial in which I'm going to make a transition to uh, Mahmoud. You mentioned that you do a lot of programs with university students in order to make sure of, uh, you know, equal representation and so on and so forth. I'm going to pass the baton to Mahmoud, given that you are in the corporate sector. Being the vice president of Dale Carnegie, I wanted to understand your thinking about youth empowerment and how does Dale Carnegie lead this and champion youth empowerment within the corporate sector? Right. Um, well, we believe that people support the work they help create. Right. So empower in this sense means, um, you know, get them to feel part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, by being listened and being given the autonomy and flexibility for them to achieve results within their defined goal. So empowered not necessarily means, you know, go and do as you wish uh, and then, you know, find out how you get things done. Also being, it comes together with support and resources that's needed uh, so that they are, so that they can, you know, proceed further and faster. And the same goes with um, corporate level, corporate, I think it's the same, corporate or university level. Um, the, the, the technical skills get things done. The soft skills are the one who help to get them to grow, uh, to get, you know, to get corporations, to get people to, to start uh, working together. So that's where Dale Carnegie comes in. And yeah, we work with a few organizations like um, Telecorp and Chara Kitchen every year on our Global Day of Giving to help the, the, the youth in, you know, they, they, assuming they have already the technical skills or, or the, uh, in, in schools. So we have them in the soft side of, soft skill side of the development, you know, to get them more um, boost to, to, to proceed further, to, to grow. I like that, Mahmoud. I think you, you took the definition of empowerment to another level whereby it's not just about uh, being independent, it's not just about pursuing your dream, but actually also reaping off all, all the resources that are available out there in order for you to then um, pursue that particular dream. So I believe that's what Dale Carnage does because you speak a lot about that. We will speak more about that, but I just want to quickly go to Point Shireen. Now, uh, Point Shireen has been championing, championing youth empowerment ever since well, forever. I remember I was in university 
I met her in the UK and she encourages youth to be the best version of themselves. So she encouraged me to be the best version of myself. So perhaps let's, let's give the floor to Quan Shireen. Quan, do you agree with this definition of youth empowerment that Sun Singh, Harvina and Mahmoud have given? And perhaps you can share your perspective about what really youth empowerment means when it comes to nation building and them championing or eradicating poverty in this country. Thank you, Rauda. Um, I'll, I'll just maybe broadly um, address the word empowerment, because to me, empowerment means uh, equity and opportunities. That means everybody has got, you know, the, the, the opportunity to participate in, in whatever field that they are engaged in. And, and it's equitable for all types of, you know, talent, whether you are young, you're middle, uh, sort of uh, mid-career, or even senior folks, right? So, so, so that in itself is already, um, you know, a very powerful uh, concept. When you put the youth into that mix, that means youth empowerment, it becomes even more uh, inspiring because we are all, uh, you know, uh, engaged in, in um, working together with young people. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, my, my history working with young people. Uh, and, and it's always about opportunities and, and you know, um, sharing those kind of knowledge or experiences for the, the, uh, the young people. Uh, uh, talent to to then you know be part of uh, this whole uh, growth where where there are a lot of opportunities and and I think that's a good thing for a na for a nation. So going back to nation building, we do need to mobilize our young people to take roles that would support their growth first. And also, in so doing, support the growth of the nation, support uh, you know uh, uh, communities that they are engaged with, so that then you know there is a very strong movement toward you know continuing to make this nation great. So uh, the past uh, leaders uh, also were young when they were engaged in, in nation building. So it's a continuous sort of uh, process that we go into. But maybe in, 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 in the spirit of looking at youth and uh, empowerment, a lot more effort, a lot more uh, uh, focus needs to be uh, mobilized towards uh, young people so that then, you know, you, you are strengthened uh, and, and, and have a, a lot more um, tools at your disposal to, to really be even greater than the forefathers of this nation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juan. I, I just wanted to um, continue with your discussion because you mentioned something about mobilization of youth empowerment, ensuring that the youth have the necessary resources and support in order for them to be empowered in the first place. Um, do you think, and I'm, I'm still going to stay with you, Juan, do you think the country um, has mobilized enough support mm -hmm. and resources for the youth, for them to essentially, you know, become the best version of themselves or to pursue their dreams or, or to be in, in corporate sector or in, in, the mm. in, in, the in the politics sector and so on. Um, and if not, what else can be done in order to amplify that youth empowerment journey of the youth in the country? I think it goes both ways, right? The young, young folks, um, you don't necessarily need to wait for all of us to sort of give you those opportunities. It's not about that. It's also for the youth, uh, you know, feeling or, or, or subscribing very strongly about certain things, about their values, and they want to grab those opportunities. So it's both ways, right? Um, and, and when you have that kind of good symbiotic relationship where, you know, the, the seniors kind of uh, open up those opportunities, the young ones grab them or even create your own, that's where you have a vibrant kind of um, uh, society. So, so I think it's a, it's a two-way street. Um, the, the, the young folks also need to then, you know, just go and, uh, you know, grab the whatever that's available or if it, there, there isn't any, create your own. I, uh, your example of you, Rauda, you created your own uh, organization because you felt very passionately about it, right? So no, no, no senior folks helped you to sort of, uh, you know, do that, but it came out of you, uh, uh, you know, wanting to do something. So, so that's, that's the, the view. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we can do a lot more. Uh, I've been very fortunate because when I was a young one, <laughs> at the age of 37, I was given the opportunity to uh, head uh, Mercy Malaysia. And Mercy Malaysia is an organization, a medical relief organization that had operations from Sudan all the way to North Korea. So I had to learn very quickly 
but I had, you know, mentors, I had people around me who encouraged me, who supported me and, and all that, right? So for me, if I've had that journey, I want everybody else in that age group or even younger to actually have that journey and start even younger because you can do a lot more, right? So, so um, you know, so people who have um, maybe had that direct experience uh, would feel a lot stronger about this, but I think there is an opportunity for us to galvanize those kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the organizations or movements where uh, the, the um, senior folks actually then mo uh, mobilize the, the young ones with their experience and their wisdom sometimes. Understood. And I agree 100% with you, Point, that, um, you know, a lot of times there needs to be that two way street as well, where the youth is need to take the necessary initiatives to start something. Um, and yeah, thank you for acknowledging me, you know, a fun fact, I started Accelerate um, right after graduation. So two years ago, graduating from the UK, coming back to this country, <laughs> not having a network, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to start this. And Point Shireen was one of the people that I talked to that actually encouraged me to start it um, myself as well. Now, on to that topic about, you know, youth as participation, youth as engagement, and actually, um, you know, just, just taking charge. I wanted to pass the baton back to Sun Seng um, and see, are there any increase in youth as participation rates? As you can see in TFM, I'm sure there is, uh, but is there any change in trend since the first time you started and, and today? Yeah, absolutely, Rada. I think that, you know, Teach from Malaysia in, a, in and of itself is an example of an avenue that has increased uh, the ability for, for youth to, to do something and play a part in nation building. So, you know, I, I, I didn't found Teach from Malaysia. Um, Teach from Malaysia was founded by um, Zamir and Kiran um, back in, in 2010. And at that point in time, in 2010, when Teach from Malaysia was being founded, I had just started uh, a job uh, um, in in the corporate sector, and you know I had heard I had heard about Teach from Malaysia um, uh, when they just started it, and I remember thinking to myself because I was just starting work as well. I was like, oh, that sounds like such a great initiative. Um, but, you know, now I've got a quote unquote real job and, you know, I've got to like work in the corporate sector because that's what you're supposed to do. Right. Um, and but when Teach from Malaysia really came live and on board, you know, it was something that spoke to me and it was something that um, I really felt like I wanted to contribute to. And eventually did quit my job to join Teach from Malaysia, thinking that I would do it for two years and go back to the corporate sector, um, but have remained uh, in, in um, the social sector, uh, in education, in this nation building work um, for uh, the past 10 years now. And, you know, so Teach from Malaysia in and of itself is an example of, of of an avenue in which young people have, you know, really who have probably never imagined a career in the social sector or in nation building, who have made that change um, and have uh, come into uh, into this sector or into this field. So it's 448 um, people who have uh, either done or are doing the Teach for Malaysia program currently uh, at this point in time. But you know that that's just one aspect of it, and I think that around the time um, and 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 Puncheri was was contributing to this uh, in her role as well right well whether at Kazana Talent Corp but at, at this point in time there was also um, a increase in sort of young uh, participation from youth so you know organizations like Teach from Malaysia were coming up around this time you know I think some of us would have heard of organizations like Epic um, uh, Epic Homes working with Orang Asli people so basically around that time there was sort of this mushrooming of um, uh, youth who were just saying hey I want to get in and do something but the avenue that was created was for young people to get involved directly uh, in nation building work and uh, Teach from Malaysia is an example of that, but I think that the what what the, these are small pockets, right? Like I said, Teach from Malaysia, we brought in four hundred and forty eight people, right? That that's uh, that's a number that we're very proud of. But when we think of the grand scale of things, um, that's not enough, and that's where we believe that education, in and of itself, um, the experience that you have in school needs to be the thing, um, that really empowers kids to be able to take action. Um, and I would say that what we've what we've then seen uh, from Teach from Malaysia's perspective um, through the work of our alumni uh, in starting their own organizations that work um, to empower students. Um, we've seen that mushrooming happen and I think that what we would have all seen across this um, uh, these past 
uh, year and a half um, since the pandemic has started is that the voice of youth has suddenly um, a spotlight has been shown on that recently. And, and we've seen that social media, you know, social media has many ills, but it has been used very effectively at this point in time as well as a platform for young people to make their voice heard. And, um, and not just heard, but we've seen that translate into certain um, sets of actions as a result of that. And so I think that we do see that. Um, but I think the, the last thing that I'll say before I, uh, before I pause here is that what we're very conscious of at Teach from Malaysia is that I think that as a certain portion of the populace becomes more and more educated, um, they, they become more passionate about nation building and they become more passionate about their role um, in that. But there is, a, there is a gap that continues to persist. And if we do not ensure that everyone across the board um, have access to a quality education, you're going to see a widening disparity in, in thought or belief um, about how to move forward as a nation and people getting left out uh, from that conversation. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the social media platforms and the awareness that's being raised, um, they're very powerful, but they honestly only speak to a certain segment uh, of the population. And that really needs to grow uh, and expand to become more mainstream. Understood. Thank you, Sun Singh. I'm going to take your last spot there about you know, having the gap. As more and more youths become educated, then we can see the gap that exists. And so then there's a different, a different opinion about how the country should move forward. I'm going to pass it to Harvina, actually, because this is what she's doing with uh, Lean in Youth, ensuring that, you know, that there's the, the, the gap is not as wide. And that's what all of you are doing there at, at uh, Lean in Youth, where you have this workshops and, and this programs to make sure that you know all youths are given uh, the similar access to education and similar access to upskilling programs so why don't you talk more Harvina about the work that Lean In Youth are doing in actually reducing this gap that Sun Singh has brought forward right um, so maybe just to give a bit of a background on Lean In Youth um, initially uh, so, Lean in, so Lean in Youth is uh, a circle under Lean in Malaysia, and Lean in Malaysia was created to uh, to encourage the empowerment uh, the empowerment of uh, women in Malaysia to become change makers towards positive change. But um, at Lean in Malaysia, uh, they realized that um, so their target audience is mostly wo young working women, but they realized that there is actually an opportunity for us to to create, to start this paradigm shift from an earlier age, because people's, uh, uh, most uh, people's views towards, uh, you know, things such as uh, women's empowerment and uh, gender equality, it all starts from an earlier age, which is why we started Lean in Youth, because we felt that by uh, empowering youths from a younger age, um, uh, encouraging them to, 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 to harness their, their passions towards uh, nation building. Um, it all start uh, if you start uh, if you if you start all of this encouragement from a younger age, you you can you can create that paradigm shift a lot more effectively. So uh, uh, at Lean in Youth, we try to uh, not just work directly with youths, but we also try to work with uh, large institutions like universities and and the corporate sector to to get them to think to to get them to embrace this paradigm shift especially especially with the corporate sector to get them to embrace this uh this uh change in thinking you know that um that youths uh, that youths by virtue of their age they lack leadership uh, uh abilities which is not the case the, the uh, youths are perfectly capable of harnessing uh, of harnessing their their leadership potential and creating uh, and, and creating uh, positive change. For example, like you, Radha, you are actually the youngest person on this panel, and uh, you've done so much with Accelerate. Um, I'd also like to highlight that Lean in Youth, all of our, actually, I think uh, I'm actually the, the oldest uh, a person in, in, in Lean in Youth. The rest of our the rest of our Lean in Youth members, they're all uh, in their early to mid twenties only. So. I think that if we start encouraging youths from, a, from an earlier age, much like what uh, uh, Sun Singh is doing with Teach for Malaysia and what we are trying to do with university uh, students, 
if we encourage them from an earlier age to harness their potential and and create this uh, uh create uh, this sense of uh uh independence and 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 instill confidence in them to uh, in their own abilities i think we would be able to create a lot more uh, uh, we would be able to create more uh future leaders uh, uh in malaysia who uh who 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 will be able to affect more positive change in this country yeah, super, Harvina. Now, I'm going to move to Mahmoud because I'm seeing what Sun Singh mentioned and what Harvina mentioned. Uh, actually, both what they mentioned um, is intertwined to what Mahmoud does. So Sun Singh mentioned that education is really vital in order to move forward, uh, you know, in, in order to champion youth empowerment, in order to make sure that you, the youth are empowered. Harvina mentioned that it's important um, for the youth to start as early as possible, for us to empower the youth uh, as early as possible. In Dale Carnegie, Mahmoud, do you think, um, or rather not do you think actually, do you see um, the youth as participation rate increase? And at what age um, do you go start accepting this youth as in Dale Carnegie? And perhaps how, do, how does Dale Carnegie encourage um, the, this youth to step out of their comfort zone and incorporate? I mean, as, as you know, um, in corporate, I think there's a lot of stigma on hierarchies, stigma on professionalism, stigma on lots of things. So how does Dale Carnegie encourage these youths to step out of their comfort zone and just, you know, contribute right um well for for Dale Carnegie we do accept as early as eight years old to 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 our programs that yeah, we have to do program for for kids um the the method is different but um uh, you know uh, the first time we did it I was quite surprised for an eight years old able to understand the concept that we are trying to push to them um but yeah of course we need to change the, the, the delivery way of it but um, yeah, it shows that they are able to understand the concept. They are able to to understand the that you know they have to work with each other. They have to work within the system. Um, and 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 yeah. So the, the, I think uh, even at eight years old can shows that then you know it'd be much easier for for the elderly as well uh, for for the for for the elder uh, age. Um, as for us, we we always push on. You know, <clears throat> being the better person always be a better person do not prove yourself but improve yourself mm -hmm. so um always get them you know it is okay to listen from other others opinion uh and to see things from their point of view so it goes both sides from from youth to the to the senior and the senior to the to the youth as well um so that allows us to work together more more coherently yeah, and I'm actually surprised that, you know, you actually start accepting youths at the age of eight. I'm starting to wonder, what did I do at the age of eight years old? Oh my goodness. Well, that's fantastic. Now, there is a question in the chat box. Um, I sort of posed it to Mahmoud, uh, but I thought of just posing it to everybody and I'm going to chip in as well. So the question is from Noor Farisha. And essentially, it's about how do we encourage youths to be brave enough to take risk and become problem solvers? Now, I'm going to chip in here, although I'm a moderator, if I may, Pao and Puan Churi. So Definitely. I started Accelerate two years ago. And what I did was I bought myself a one-way ticket. I've been thinking about starting a social enterprise for three years, ever since I started um, university. And I graduated and I got all these job offers right in front of me. And obviously, there's a social pressure of accepting them. Um, and then one day I was actually picking up my brother in university in Uniten and I told myself, you know what, I am going to SSM today to register my social enterprise, although at the time I did not know what exactly the business plan would be or you know how I'm going to rally this resource to mobilize what I want to do. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to buy that one way ticket. And once I register the company, there's no way back. And that was how I got myself out of the comfort zone, which it did uh, tremendously well, I guess. So that's what I did. Um, I think if there is any advice to encourage youths to step out of their comfort zone is to just um, do it and address something that, that, that you fear the most. And, and once you get that wall out of the picture, then the rest would be so much easier. But that's just me, right? So let's hear from the panelists. Uh, maybe, Mahmoud, we can go back to you because you worked with eight years old, eight year old youths. Let's speak. Okay, there's a, I think there's an eight year old beside you. <laughs> six. <laughs> oh, six. Okay. 
Yeah, go on, Mahmoud, for you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question again. Uh, how do how do you? Yeah. Um, we always believe that you know, um, uh, for a person to change, we need to get the attitude right first. So even before they attend the training or the courses, we get them to agree on right. These are the things that you are lacking. You are saying this. We also you know found that or your superiors not found that the same thing. Uh, then that's why you need to be in the in in the in the, in the session. And that's where the session comes in. That's where the knowledge comes in. And we give them the knowledge. We give them the encouragement, and they practice among themselves. Uh, and the, the knowledge can be gotten from you know. You can just Google how to become a better person or whatnot. But that that will just a knowledge. Then you'll be stuck at the. We don't want you. We don't want to stuck in 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 the knowledge trap, where you have it in your head. But you don't know how to get the hands to go about it, yeah. So that's where the practice comes in, and practice. Well, most people say practice makes perfect. Um, we believe that practice makes permanent. So if you practice correctly, you'll be perfectly correct. If you practice wrongly, then you you'll be perfectly wrong. <laughs> so that's why when you are practice, you need to be coach as well. You need, you need someone to guide you to to bring you back to the to the line to the straight lines and once you figure it out you know it's easy to be done it's uh it's doable you know and the impact is great then you uh tend to to do it all over again then it becomes a habit so so when we address the children or, or our participants it always goes around that cycle of growth and change so that you know they have to the acknowledge they go through the experience and with with a, with a coaching that will help to to turn it to to a habit or to expand their or to do things you know, to expand their comfort zone slowly and slowly to to make it wider and bigger. I love it, Mahmoud. Practice makes permanence. Oh yes, indeed. I actually agree with you. That's the first time I hear about it, and I think that's just going to be my mantra now. As opposed to practice makes perfect. What you mentioned, um, you, you really just encaps encapsulate everything that Sun Singh and Harvina and Puan Shireen mentioned earlier as well. When we talk about encouraging the youth is to do something um, that is outside of their comfort zone, it all begins at an early age. Number one, it all begins with accountability. And I think that is exactly what Sun Singh and Harvina and Puan Shireen are doing, educating them at such a young age. Now, I'm not going to dwell on that question so much because there is another one. Um, and I must address this now because I feel like this is really important. This is from Shahnaz, she mentioned that the world is getting more complex. Couldn't agree more. It is. Life itself is complex. Scarcity of resources will be a challenge. Youthers will need to be in a leadership role to solve those issues faster than what it has been in the last decade, precisely. So I feel there is a sense of urgency in ensuring our youthers are empowered and ready. Um, and then she just wanted to hear thoughts from all the panelists today um, on these comments of urgency of the youth needing to be in the leadership roles and perhaps what should be done to support youth in this um, pressured environment or maybe support need not be given. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Should the support be given or not? I'm going to open it up to everybody. Feel free to unmute yourself and answer that question. Let's answer that, that first. Should support be given or not? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, definitely. And I think Pontarian talked about this earlier, right? It's it's a two way street, right? Young people need to step up, um, but there also needs to be avenues that are given uh, for young people uh, to support. So Rhoda, can I go into the rest of the question or should, we, should I pause there? So, I mean, I think that uh, the absolutely right that there is urgency and there is so much untapped potential in our young people that we don't leverage right even when we think about the right to vote right and how much of a struggle it is to bring that down to 18 uh to 18 years old um you're considered a legal adult but you just can't vote right and, and so that that is an example of the type of quote-unquote support or the political leverage that needs to happen to empower young people but i'll give you an example about how we uh about education right and um, from both ends, from the student, uh, from the student's perspective, as well as how do we transform the education system through leadership in the system? And so, you know, I think that there needs to be support for a student. Uh, and, and this will touch on some of the other questions as well that people have asked, but there needs to be a support from uh, for young people across across the life cycle, right? And so, you know, I, I love that Dale Carnegie takes in kids of, of eight years old, right? But we really need to nurture leadership across the life cycle of a child throughout their education into university 
as they enter into their career. And there needs to be a process that we invest and nurture in leadership. So oftentimes, especially in Malaysia, we have this, um, uh, we, we have this misconception about leadership, that leadership is positional. Because of who I am or because of the position I have, I am therefore a leader. Um, but at Teach for Malaysia, and you know, most of the leadership literature will tell us that leadership is competency, right? Leadership is a disposition. Leadership is something that you build and you develop uh, and uh, that you can grow um, over time. And so that's something that we then need to invest in, uh, in our young people. And to the point of like taking risks, problem solving, how do, we, uh, how do we do that? So for an example of what Teach for Malaysia does that we would really love to see embedded in the education system, but we kind of run this as a, as a standalone is that we've been um, running student leadership programs um, for, uh, for kids. And what they do is they go through uh, a design thinking process um, to identify uh, a problem. And it's very low stakes, right? So they go through a design thinking process to identify a problem in their school. They have to come up with a solution, articulate that, um, and then they get funding uh, to implement that solution. And we see that when kids are leading that process, number one, it, it enables them to feel a sense of agency. Um, but then when they implement the solution, they take ownership of that and make sure that that sustains, right? Um, so an example of this is uh, a kid um, felt like their toilets were really dirty, um, but if they were to repair those toilets, they, um, uh, they would just get vandalized um, again. And so what they then did was these kids got all the kids who vandalized the toilets to basically repaint, um, to design whatever they wanted the toilets to look like, to repaint it, to change it. And, the, and they then became the kids that made sure that nobody else vandalized the toilets, right? And so we gave them, uh, you know, there, there was a sum of money that was funded uh, to them and, and they were then able to do that. So simple, small, small scale, but low stakes thing. And so in ensuring that kids have experience to actually implementing solutions even at um, uh, even at a very young age, right? But that then needs to happen across the life cycle uh, of a young person, right? So going into university, and you know, obviously this is where where some of the work of lead in comes in, right? But then, how do you have access to leadership opportunities when you go into um, a, a workplace setting? Are you just there to uh, what do us as employers? Do we look at young people as just people to get the job done, or do we see them as a succession plan? Do we see them as a pipeline of talent? So. So a challenge then, if we look at system-wide in the Ministry of Education, and if we want to see, so we're saying that if we want to see youth empowerment, it needs to come through education. But in order to do that, we need to transform the system. But in the Malaysian education system, to get into a position of leadership, you have to typically serve 25 years. And it's tenure promotion in the Ministry of Education is typically tenure based. So if you want young innovative school leaders, if you want young innovative state uh, heads of uh, um, state education departments, that's practically not going to happen. You will never see a 35 year old um, head of state education department. You will never see a 40 year old director general of education in Malaysia because it is a tenure based system. And so then from this, when we, when we talk about support, we have to think about the structures uh, that exist in our civil service and our political environment. And that needs to change to think about how we empower young people to be in positions of authentic, legitimate leadership uh, at, a much, uh, at a much younger age. And so we are really losing out on the potential. There are 420,000 teachers in the Ministry of Education, and we lose out on all of their youth potential by making them wait 25 years to get into a leadership position. So there, there are things that we need to develop young people and nurture across the life cycle, but we need to structurally change things that exist in order to enable young people um, to lead. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. And I agree with you 100% in terms of actually ensuring that we don't, we no longer miss out on these youths who actually are capable of, you know, building our nation and actually improving the country. Um, I'm actually going to pose a question to Juan Shireen. It is, it, is, it is an extension of what Sun Singh mentioned, um, you know, about the 25 year tenure, having to serve the government for 25 years, this, this um, systemic issue, I, I, I call it. Do you think this comes from a negative connotation as to the fact that youths are too young and not mature enough, you know, no matter 
uh, how many times we prove ourselves to the society and to the community that we're capable, there are still such negative connotations that they require more um, coaching or more experience and, 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 and so on and so forth. Do you think this is the case as to why the systemic issues mm-hmm. still exist? And if it is still the case, um, what, are perha- what are the shift in mindset that must be done um, either by the government or either by the people in the corporate who perhaps are no longer youth this? In the government is going to be tough because of what Sun Singh has just said. It's structurally uh, designed that way. The policies support that kind of, um, you know, uh, tenure, ten, tenure, tenure, and, and, and even longer. And the culture, uh, we have this culture of, you know, if you've been around 15 years, you're, or you're much smarter than a young one that has more energy and has uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, even more uh, smarter, right? So it's about you know how long you've been in that position or how long you've been in that organization. So government is going to be tough because structurally, in culture, and all that, uh, they are trying. They have tried, uh, and you know, young people have come up through the ranks, but the top positions are still your sixty-something year olds or, or even about to retire. So when we look at government, say, if you're about to retire and you are holding a very senior position, you're not going to do very much to actually, um, you know, improve, uh, you know, the way government engages young people or policy making and all that because you're you're ready to move on, right? So um, the 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 thinking and the consciousness needs to be there in government to actually pick out young people. So what they've done, and and you know, I wouldn't say that they've not done anything. If you know about the Padana Fellowship. Uh, you know, they've created that for young people to be special officers, to ministers and have these kind of positions that, you know, at the end of the day, they may not uh, enter civil service, but they have networks, they have built, you know, uh, you know their, their own capabilities and all that. So the Padana Fellowship is a very, uh, you know, strong uh, and, and important uh, initiative that the government has taken. And, and uh, I wish they would do more and de- uh, do uh, get deeper into the, the, the whole program and really build this um, young talent towards very senior position and have that structure where, you know, there is a coaching mechanism, uh, there's, uh, you know, mentors who will, who will support you and, and, you know, and policies that will change for a certain position, say for youth uh, uh, ministry, certain positions at a very senior level, you, you know, the, the maximum age, put in, put in a policy like that has got to be only like, I don't know, 40 or less. So then you are consciously moving towards engaging young people to take on those positions. But we don't have those policies. If you look at uh, the West, um, you know, I always go, go to, to Europe and, and the Scandinavian countries, even in their parliament, uh, you know, they, they are consciously saying that X percentage of their, their, their representation has got to be, uh, you know, 30 and below. Right. So when you have that consciousness, then it changes the, the policy needs to drive it. Uh, I know people will debate about quota, but at the point where you want to start, you got to do that. And then after a while, it becomes a culture that people expect young people to be at the decision making table. Right. But right now, if we don't do that, then then we're going to lose the game. Because uh, uh, in the time when I was in, in Talangkot, we were very worried about young people who were living, leaving the country and going to uh, other greener pastures. We were at 15 percent of young people either leaving or those who are studying abroad didn't want to come back because of the system of, you know, I don't know where my career growth is going to be. So our government needs to, 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 to deepen their, their engagement and, and really write, have the right kind of policies. Our organizations as well, uh, you know, in my observation, uh, and, and in fact, people tell me uh, a certain oil and gas company, I wouldn't name which one, uh, you have to wait 15 years before you get promoted to be a manager. 15 years is too long for the country and for the talent. And, and a lot of the attrition is happening at that, at that group of people because they can't wait 15 years. And they have worked you know, and earned their, their, their sort of um, uh, expertise and experience and, and it's because of a tenure. So those kind of things need to change uh, and we have to be very conscious about it and, and create those kind of uh, policies and opportunities. A great point. Um, there is actually a, a comment here from uh, Ms. Adriana that actually supports what you just mentioned about changing the setup of the politics. If we talk about policies, policies won't change if they're just, you know, 
the same people in the cabinet, for instance. So um, she mentioned that more youth just need to stand for election to get into policymaking. And perhaps another way is the engagement with the policymakers via NGOs. She actually also mentioned something really interesting here. And the fact that youth just need to be very careful that some mentors might be mentoring them on the wrong things, such as corruption and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm gonna move the conversation to Mahmoud and Harvina, because this is something that you both are doing as well, mentoring. I believe Lean in Youth provides mentors to the youth as well. And Mahmoud as well, you work a lot um, in terms of upskilling and training these youth in order to become leaders themselves. Um, what are your take on mentors mentoring on the wrong things for the youth is? And how do you, I mean, your organization specifically, how do you filter um, the right mentors to mentor these youth is? Uh, perhaps you can start with uh, Mahmoud. Uh, well, that, that, that's something that, you know, um, different people might have different perspective on how to do things. Um, we might think right, some people might, uh, and it goes vice versa. Um, what's important is, and, and, you know, it's difficult for us to say, you know, that thing is wrong when they definitely say it is correct. So that's why it is important for, for us or for the youth or for the children to start having a role model from the house itself from home to have uh to be able to to balance or to to see or draw a line which one is good which one is not um some mentors who might not have you know, might not be a good person in but you know the idea or the the thing is might be you know might be useful if it is implemented in in a good way so the mentee is the one who needs to filter out what is the what is the goal, what is the, the end that they're looking for. Um, and if, if I may add on to, to the having youth in, in senior leadership, right? Uh, and I, I agree with uh, Sun Seng that leadership is and it's always about leading the discipline. The, subordinate, the people under them, um, but actually, leadership can uh, well leader people can still lead upward. So as long as we have a lot of you in the in the organizations in the system, and they are able or manage to lead their leaders or you know uh, encourage the leaders towards you know giving more opportunities to the youth, then I think that that's a good start already for us. Uh, instead of you know having to wait or to go very rebel to to get you know younger people on on the position, can I just jump in, Rauda? Yes, yes uh, from the it. point that Mahmoud made, um, you know the people around the youth. So we're all um, either we're parents, we're sisters, we're brothers, we are friends, right? So you know your 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 mentoring or the people you you surround yourself matters. So you know, uh, we have we have a role to also you know get, demonstrate the right kind of values, build the right kind of value systems, and coach uh, you know our our young ones, and and you know the the youth uh, like uh, what Mahmoud says, your role model and all that, right? So find the mentors for different things. If you feel that this one person uh, is a good mentor to teach me or to share with me what are their leadership experience, go to that person. If the other person and you really want to do some practical uh, learning, uh, you know, you want to learn finance in running an organization, find another mentor that's that. So it doesn't mean it's just one person that's your role model. It's different, different people who's going to give you the diversity of, you know, uh, uh, experience and, and push you along. That's going to then make it very holistic. And if you find enough good people around you, then the value system is enforced, right? So if there are other mentors who have, you know, uh, crazy ideas, want to, uh, you know, uh, destroy your, your, your good values, you have enough people around you to actually then give you that support. So I think we're all very smart to sniff out the bad ones. And if we so want to associate ourselves with the bad one, we take the accountability and responsibility to actually say, oh, I choose to, you know, work with this guy and I know he has no integrity, whatever, right? So we all need to be very mature in our choices. We have to guide, but as parents, as friends, whatever, we, we mentor each other. It's not a top-down relationship. It's, it's, it's very much very lateral, I think. 
because I learn a lot for young people who work with me and they do cross mentoring. So, you know, uh, that's a fantastic way to actually then uh, learn and, and share. Agreed, uh, Puan and Mahmoud. I think that accountability and you choosing the people to surround you, that is a really um, vital element, especially when you do want to grow either in your career or in your life. Um, the question that I have for Harveen, actually, when we talk about, because Mahmoud and Puan Sharin mentioned this, choose who you want to surround yourself with. Um, and a lot of times, uh, some, not a lot of times, sometimes some youth is who are given a certain mentor, for instance, or a certain coach, and they realize that maybe this is not a perfect fit. Um, we must also address the issue where perhaps the youth is are not willing to voice out that, hey, you know what, <laughs> you're not a perfect fit for me. Don't think it's working out. How does Lean in Youth empower these youths to take charge, to take accountability, and to, to, to you know, make a decision? Hey, you know what, I don't think... I'm going with you, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're going to add value to some people, but not to me. How does Lean in Youth encourage youths to have a voice for themselves in order to choose who they surround themselves with? Well, I think uh, Mahmoud and, and Puan Sharin, they've actually, uh, they actually did sort of touch on this uh, uh, in their comments. So it's not so much a top-down relationship. So you don't just get a sign. We, we generally, uh, so, uh, we, we generally uh, ad, uh, uh, tell you it's that it's not really a top-down relationship where you get assigned a mentor and you have to stick with that person. You, you have to take a more, you need to take a more holistic view when it comes to picking and choosing mentors. It's not something that is given to you. You have to also uh, think about what it is that uh, you want out of life. Where do you, what is the sort of trajectory of your career that, that you want? So where do, so so where, where do you see your, your your career going, and what are what do you want to achieve with your career? So we would usually uh, advise uh, youths to to look at all of these factors and sort of identify who fits uh, 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 what sort of uh, which mentor or potential mentor fits all of these criteria. So who fits in with what who, who fits in with what you want out of life because um, because it's not really you, you don't just get assigned a, a, a youths generally they don't just get assigned a mentor and get stuck with that person um, if that is the case and you are sort of assigned a, a, a mentor and, and it's not really a right fit then I think you need to have a, a non, an honest conversation uh, uh, with your, your mentor and, and, you know, voice out your, your, your concerns, you know, like, hey, maybe uh, this is where I see my career going. And I, uh, I, I need someone who can sort of guide me towards reaching these, these goals. So if you're not able to do that, I might have to, uh, uh, if you're not, able to do that I sort of need to look for someone who can it, it, it's all about being honest and frankly um, I think I think mentors do appreciate that honesty because they are also investing their time it, towards mentoring you and they obviously want to be able to create a good uh, uh, create a positive impact with their their mentoring and if their mentoring is not effective then they they need to know that and maybe you know it can also help them improve as mentors because it's a two way it's a two way relationship it's not just about what a mentee uh it's not just about what a mentee gets out of the relationship with the mentor the mentor also gets something out of this out of their relationship with their mentee so if you have so just to summarize uh, all, all the points i've just said honesty is really important in a mentor mentee relationship if you don't feel if a mentee feels like they're not really getting something out of the if if a mentee feels like the, there's something lacking in the relationship or they could be getting more out of the relationship from their mentor then they need to be uh, they need to be proactive and voice out those concerns and I can guarantee you in most of in most of most of the cases, your mentor would appreciate the, the feedback from, from their mentee because it'll help them become better mentors uh, in, uh, in the future. And that is something that most good mentors uh, uh, would value. 
So on uh, being honest and being proactive in taking charge of what you want out of the mentor mentee relationship is very, very important. That, that's what I would say. Super, Harvina. I think honesty definitely is um, is key. And I, I don't know who need to hear this, but we've got about 40 participants out there. When 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 we talk about honesty, when we talk about communication, um, I just wanted to reach out to the youthers who perhaps are, you know, a little bit feeling a little bit scared to actually be honest, because they are. I mean, just to share uh, with the panelists and uh, with the audience, I work with a lot of underprivileged and marginalized youthers um, whom when, you know, when, when they've got teachers or counselors, uh, for instance, in school, uh, and when they've got a session with them, uh, normally, and a lot of times, they get very scared to actually voice out their opinion and be honest, because they feel like, you know what, maybe I shouldn't say anything because they're superior than me, and so on and so forth. And I guess I'm just trying to reach out to the youth who are feeling the same um, I wanted to share with all of you that I personally had an experience working with a mentor who was um, degrading me from the start and I actually realized it's only halfway um, I remember she was one of the people that I talked to when I first came back from the UK and started Accelerate um, and I remember the first call I had with her, she was actually questioning my ability and my capability to start Accelerate. And I thought, you know what, that's, that's, that's normal and it was more like challenging you to be better. That's what I thought. And I realized along the line, she was essentially just degrading me. Um, and there was a lot of, I don't think you know what you want. I don't think you actually want to start a social enterprise. I think you're just, and I remember the words. I think you're just an entitled millennial who doesn't want to accept job offers and you just wanted to start your own. And that's when I actually realized that this is toxic. And I think um, I personally, you know, uh, was was quite scared to 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 untie the relationship. But I did it anyway. And I think what Harina mentioned, having that honesty speaking is vital um, and you need to know exactly what is good for you. Um, and to those of you perhaps who are listening and who are experiencing the same um experience as me know that i've been there and it's completely fine for you to say no to a certain individual who are perhaps helping you or coaching you if it is not at all benefiting uh, you so if you are in position know that one of us have been there i mean i've been there and i've said no before no relationship at all with her but it's completely fine because there are a lot more people out there who are willing to actually help you grow in not just your career but also your personal life now i want to close that chapter there are a lot of comments right in. i'm gonna perhaps start reading it um so there is essentially okay a lot of our mentoring actually so knowing knowing what you want good or bad right or wrong it is you don't have to be taught by either coaches or mentors uh, and then youthers must actually be be conscious about what they wish and what they want as well i completely agree with all of this actually now i'm going to turn the table around to sun Seng actually um because you mentioned and this goes back to our conversation earlier you mentioned something about when we educate youthers and when there are a lot more educated youths, there is a gap that will exist either now, later, or in the future. Do you see this gap um, between the rural and uh, the urban youths, or do you see the gaps just you know between rural to rural or urban to urban? And if that's the case, how is TFM addressing this to reduce the gap um, and to increase the participation rate amongst the rural youths? Should it be the case that the gap is um, on, on that side of the sea. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, um, Rada, I think it, the typical gaps that, that exist or the typical lines of divide uh, in the Malaysian education system, obviously there are many more, but the most obvious ones are the rural urban divide and also um, the household income divide. So um, those who have a higher income have you know, more access to participation, more access and exposure to awareness um, and uh, uh, the same on the, uh, I mean, the opposite on the flip side, right? Uh, for low income uh, students from low income families or students from rural areas. And so even students from, uh, higher income backgrounds in the most rural areas, they struggle with access to, um, uh, you know, just information awareness, exposure and uh, opportunities. And I'll give you an example, right? So like I said, we Teach for Malaysia has been uh, running um, uh, these student leadership camps. In fact, this year, um, we're launching a new, uh, a new program with City Foundation that is going to be open to, to all kids from B40 communities. Um, and there's going to, they're going to, we'll give them a 
take them through a course, a student leadership course, and there's going to be a youth innovation challenge at the end of it where they can um, submit their proposal and get funding uh, to, uh, to implement their solution. And that's for um, all secondary school age kids uh, anywhere in the country, um, and, uh, but focusing on students from B40 backgrounds. So I'll give you an example of, uh, of a time when we ran um, uh, one of these camps in, in Sabah, and we, we work in some Borna in Sabah, which is the lowest performing education district uh, in the country. And we had these kids that were, um, uh, that came and joined our camp, um, and they, uh, they then um, won uh, the, the state level. So we, we, how we structured it was that every state, you know, you could win. Um, and we wanted to then create an opportunity for these kids to then come and meet kids from the other states. So they, uh, they then came, uh, they won at, at the state level, and then they came to the national uh, level where they met kids from other states. But I'll give you an example. The, the, there were kids um, in this team, or there was a kid in this team that didn't have documentation um, because there are many stateless kids or kids that just don't have documentation um, in, uh, in Sabah. And so this kid, one of the kids could not fly um, to KL to participate. Um, but fortunately, you know, the teacher works really hard with, um, uh, with, with the, the local departments and authorities to get this kid a letter so that they were able to fly to KL. And the, the, this is the first time these kids had ever come to KL. They were like, we want to see the LRT. We want to see the Twin Towers. Um, but, but you can see just how, I, I mean, and that's an anecdotal story to just show how different kind of the access, the ability to access opportunities are. Whereas kids here in KL, right, you know, there are opportunities uh, all around and it's so easy to access uh, opportunities and you can literally physically access them. Uh, the benefit of, of now is that there's so many things online, but then you have the digital divide that um, that blocks that, right? So we, we intentionally at Teach from Malaysia, you know, we send our fellows into high need schools and we, we then run programs that work directly um, with kids uh, in these schools, but there needs to be more um, there needs to be more of that. And I think that one of the things that we have to really consider um, when we think about uh, kids from, uh, from, uh, from B40 communities, from high need backgrounds is it's easy. And you know, we're, we're very proud of the work that we do in developing the competencies and skills. But if you don't have the surrounding factors that enable you um, to progress along life, it will, it's so easy. You know, we talk about stepping out of your comfort zone, but you know, I, we, I, I'll tell you the story of a kid that we worked with um, from secondary school um, to work with him to get a scholarship in, um, uh, in, in some way university, he became a student leader there. Um, he was then uh, did an internship with PwC. And we asked him, we were like, you know, you would be a perfect Teach for Malaysia fellow. Like, why don't you join the fellowship after you graduate from school? And for him, he said that, you know what, my priority is that I need to financially support my family. And so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go do this um, uh, accounting job. And so the idea of nation building, it's important to him, but not as important as his need to support his family, right? And so when we talk about youth leadership and youth participation, uh, especially for kids from um, uh, the B40 community, from the other end of the urban rural divide, you know, we can't just say we're going to give you the skills and the opportunities to develop it, but actually there needs to be so much more around the systems and infrastructure that enable them to participate in different ways. Um, uh, that a kid, uh, then a kid who, you know, maybe would have had the privilege, like to be honest for myself, I, you know, I had the quote unquote privilege to make the choice to join Teach from Malaysia and take a pay cut. Uh, from my job, um, because my parents were able to provide uh, um, for themselves. So th there are factors that we need to consider um, for these kids as well. Perfect. Can I just jump in there, Rauda? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and I like what Sinseng has said about the example of, uh, you know, kids in Sabah. One of the things that um, uh, Sejahtera is doing is in Suang Punggo, that's a, a part in Kota Belut, where the, the youth are given sort of programs for them to do to build their leadership skills. Our second pillar in AISN Sejahtera is about community leadership. 
and the focus is with the, the young ones, right? So create events, get them to, to mobilize uh, their community. And, and now with the pandemic in COVID, they're also helping their older folks to register for vaccination, giving them information on what to do, whatever, you know, so they go around their community to do that. So that's building leadership from ground up lah, at the community level, right? Because we can't always from center go there and, and do that, right? You need to build it so that then they are, they, they own their own uh, sort of um, uh, future. Uh, and then give them those sort of programs that they can do. So that's one example of what we do and uh, replicating it in other parts of the, the rural because there's a re real divide between urban and rural and opportunities and exposure that's available for kids in the in, in, in uh, rural locations, yeah. particularly in Sabah, Sarawak. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, precisely, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. Accelerate, personally, where we've also worked with the group in Sabah as well, and we can see the divide, um, you know, between them and those living in Peninsula, and there's a lot more to do, and I agree with both Sun Singh and, and Puan Shireen about community leadership and ensuring that they're able to take accountability and take the leadership position as well to run programs or, you know, to even just help out amongst the community. So, yeah. Singh, thank you so much for sharing those stories. It warms my heart. On a Saturday afternoon, I really love to hear stories on the ground about the beneficiaries and how they're empowered. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm going to move the table around a little bit. I know there's a lot of jumping here and there because we've got a really diverse panel. We've heard from Sun Singh and Puan Shireen about the gap between the youths from the urban and the rural communities and the fantastic work that they both have done in order to make sure that they reduce this gap. Let's just turn the tables around to corporate um, sector and corporate setting. And of course, this is for both Mahmoud and Harvina. In terms of the corporate um, sector, I want to essentially dissect on uh, the gap that exists perhaps between the top management level and the graduate youths who are essentially just coming into the corporations, coming into the institutions, um, and whether or not they are given a say in certain um, decision making, perhaps, and whether or not they are given a seat at the table when it comes to um, decision making or, you know, closing a deal or choosing a client and so on and so forth. And I wanted to just understand how big of a gap there is there in the corporate sector, because I personally haven't been in the corporate sector at all, and I'm personally curious as well, and I'm sure the rest of the audience is up. Mahmoud, let's start with you. I see you smiling. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I might be lucky because all the organizations I've been seeing, they are always looking into building a culture, working culture that engage to engage the young and the, the you know the different generations so in that sense um they are started to to listen to the youth to 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 the graduates fresh graduates uh from from the young people to to start suggesting giving them uh chances to speak and even now like in in del kandagi we have only three people above 30 i think and the rest are all before, below 30. So, so that that yeah. So when that happens, we can see the difference with with teen coming in, with youth coming in, uh, they are more aggressive, they are more eager to, to start things, to get things done, which actually benefits to the organization as well. So yeah, in, in that terms, depending on the organizations as well, of, uh, I suppose, um, a lot more companies are looking to close the gap, the generation gap, to be more engaged. Um, might be some who are you know, very difficult to change the culture those are big and maybe government related organizations uh, but you know even them they are also moving forward to to give more chances to the youth so that's that's a good progress i think super fantastic i did not know that that actually there are only about three people above 30 i think that's fantastic progressive yeah. harvina let's hear from you i i know that you also work in pwc malaysia apart from being yeah. pro lead of lean and youth let's talk about that um are you heard i mean okay i think that sounds a bit controversial but yeah you know is it is it a good environment for you to grow um okay so just to give a bit of context, uh, before uh, coming into PwC, I worked in the, the legal industry. And I think it, it also depends on the industry you're in because certain industries like the legal industry, it's they tend to be a bit more uh, traditional and hierarchical. So uh, in that setting, yeah, uh, 
it, it's definitely a lot more hi uh, hi hierarchical. So the youths, the the, the, the younger uh, the, the 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 younger staff, they uh, sort of they, they don't really have a choice. They have it, it. It all goes through your your partner. So it's very hierarchical. Uh, since coming into PwC and um, being more exposed towards uh, what other uh, what other uh, be, being more exposed towards like what all the other corporates are doing in KL. Uh, that's because that's my knowledge, you know, what's going on in the Klang Valley. I do think there is uh, a more concerted effort amongst the corporates towards uh, bridging that gap uh, between upper management and the more, the more junior level stuff. And I do think that as time goes by, corporate, more and more corporates are starting to, to recognize that, uh, that youths and you know, fresh graduates, youths, they are the younger level staff, they, uh, the, the lower level staff, they are able to contribute uh, and are, are capable of being uh, self-starters, uh, able to take accountability, and they're more willing to give uh, more of a, of a chance to, to, to their younger staff to voice out their opinions uh, on, you know, things. I, I think you gave the example of Choosing clients uh, uh, and helping to come up with uh, with higher level uh, decisions, um, there is still there is still a, a gap to to bridge. It's not perfect, but I do think there is a concerted effort uh, amongst a, 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 amongst a, a lot of corporate bodies to uh, give to to empower the, the, the younger staff to. To, to voice out their, their opinions and play a bigger role in, uh, uh, in the management and the running of, of the company, which is very heartening to, to see. And then you've also got companies that are starting uh, uh, leadership programs uh, in, uh, targeted specifically towards uh, uh, elevating young leaders. So for example, uh, that's the Axiata Young CEO Development Program, which I'm sure a lot of people have, have heard. They even have, uh, I believe they even run a leadership program for university students as well. And then uh, that, there's, of course, a Lean-In, uh, there's, of, of course, a Lean-In Youth. Uh, we've uh, had a, we, we've run a uh, career program for uh, final year university graduates aimed, aimed to, towards, you know, uh, gi giving them the, the tools they need to succeed in the corporate world. So there is, so I, yeah, just to summarize my, my thoughts, I do think that uh, things are improving. Uh, corporates are uh, uh, putting more stock in, uh, uh, towards, you know, the opinions and, and, and the voices of the youth. But of course, there is still a, a, a long way to go towards uh, fully bridging that gap. Understood, yeah. Harina. I think, as you mentioned, I think it's the same as Mahmoud as well. It differs between industry, um, and it depends on whether the industry is open enough. I mean, I've personally worked with, uh, with, uh, with not not work, but I've personally uh, talked to a lot of CHROs out there who are open to actually giving a seat at the table for the youthers. I see one Shireen and mute herself. Do you have anything to say about this one? No, I just wanted to add on. Um, in the corporate sector. So we've come a long way in terms of, um, you know, providing or opening up opportunities for young people. Uh, some have set up youth councils uh, parallel to their senior management team, you know, and, and, and they, they take these kind of inputs very, very seriously into the decision making. So, so that, that, that is a journey and that's a process. Um, what I'm more concerned about is those um, and, you know, the the comments in the in the chat uh, room is uh, saying about what about those kids who have no, no access, right? Uh, exactly, Tim Seng's uh, point. Uh, you know, how, how do they get these kind of opportunities? So I go back to the fact that in every community, in every district, whatever, we have a school. So how do we then with uh, Teach for Malaysia and yes, and Sejatra and all the different uh, you know partners center our effort in the schools because that's where we can also make a difference. And you know, create um, opportunities and and build capabilities or capacity for the schools to then you know take on some leadership or count, career counseling kind of um, you know approach uh, in in the way they they teach and uh, you know resources could be mobilized towards that. I think at the end of the day, you know, you go back to schools because schools have got this 
you know, a very important position in the society, the, the teachers, the school leaders to actually then, you know, demonstrate the right kind of values and also create those kind of um, uh, activities for leadership to then be, uh, be unlocked. I think all of us are born with leadership values and leadership skills. You just need to have that kind of, um, you know, environment that then uh, uh, unlocks that for you. That, that's that's my on, on the community side because uh, there's a lot that needs to be done right so I'm saying absolutely and maybe I think the one thing that I would just add to this is I think that corporate Malaysia really leads uh, leads the way in thinking about youth empowerment and development but if we think about the majority of jobs aren't actually in corporate uh, Malaysia and uh, Kazana Research Institute um, did a study in 2018 on the school to work transition and the investment overall um, in training budgets uh, is an indicator right and 74% of all corporate, uh, I mean, of all like uh, from micro to large corporations, 74% don't even have a training budget. Of course, of the large, uh, large corporations, 70% do have a training budget. But overall, if you consider where the majority of jobs are, there is no training budget. And that's an indication of the investment that we are putting in young people um, and uh, the intentionality of how we want to see them uh, progress. Um, so there are more changes that we need to make. And I think that Puncher is absolutely right. It's through the community um, development approach, right? When communities, local businesses uh, are more empowered to understand how to develop young people as well, that's where we can begin to see a more macro level shift. Agreed. I agree with you both, actually. It's just to share. Um, recently, Accelerate was, um, we were approached by a university and a school uh, in Klantan to actually run all these training sessions with their teachers and their lecturers to actually change that mindset, you know, to actually help empower more youths. I think there is a, it's work in progress for sure. But the initiatives are actually there to push for to, to push forward to the agenda of youth empowerment. Um, I think it just needs to be done on a massive scale and actually amplifying that impact, which again, like I mentioned, is a work in progress. Now, um, I am actually going to open for questions. So if um, the audiences have yep. any more questions, please feel free to type it. I, I'm not sure whether the microphone will be enabled. I'm going to have can to can enable the microphone. Yeah, actually. okay, let, I see. Audience, it's yeah. coming up. Yeah, uh, we're going to enable I, the microphone. Yeah. Wow. I just wanted to also add that, you know, um, for youth based organizations, your organization and everybody else in this in this virtual room, uh, the ones who have capital and resources need to support you guys more. Right. Remember the time, the early days when you were looking for funding to run your projects and how <laughs> I got very upset with large foundations to say, oh, they're very new. They're very young. You cannot, yeah. do, you know, what impact can they create? So I said, okay, you know, let's let by example work with uh, 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 the organization like yourselves, and and demonstrate that you know. So slowly, then people are willing are willing to open up. But in the end, in, in the first um, sort of um, request, it always gets shut because you know they think you don't have track record, therefore you're not good. So uh, you know, yeah. people with resources and capital need to make a conscious decision and commit themselves to actually support youth-based organization, especially organizations that run by youth as well, to give them that 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 opportunity or even give them that leg up for them to create that impact. And and I know you will. Um, I yeah. believe that very deeply. Thank you, Puan. Yeah, Puan actually, Puan Shireen has been championing that. Um, in terms of actually supporting uh, youth-based organizations. She supports Accelerate Global, and, and I'm eternally grateful for that as well. Uh, so there is a question here in the Q&A box, but I see Fatah raising uh, his hand. So let us hear from you. Fatah, you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question. Yeah, uh, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. Uh, so I... It, 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 there's a lot of things going on in our country right now. So one one of it is 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 uh, going towards this uh, digital evolutions and also there's a lot of startups, yeah. Which is you need a lot of youth, you need a lot of energy. You talk about startup, people are forty years old. I, I'm sorry, I'm I'm not, I'm not being biased over here, but people who are in their twenties, thirties, they have a lot of energy. They have a lot of idea passion and things like that they want to do they want to be made known out there and 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 this this thing is is not really uh, getting into their minds of what is going on especially in the malaysia landscape i know that mdac is doing something in building all these digital skills but in terms of 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 of, uh, of of driving or building that that 
kind of culture of startup. That's something that is 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 something that perhaps that might be a, a opportunity for for all the youth out there. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's. Fair. I mean, it's spot on. Um, in fact, um, just to uh, market accelerate a little bit. That's exactly what Accelerate Global does. Um, actually, our upskilling programs are tailored towards helping the youth start their own businesses and start their own startups. Um, and I completely agree with you that we definitely need to provide an avenue and a platform for these youths to be more entrepreneurial and actually to pursue um, their creative dreams. Just maybe to share with you, we've worked with over 700 youths for the past two years. Um, and alhamdulillah, all of the youth is now, we've got 100% success rate. All of them are either entrepreneurs and started their own businesses or um, have actually gone into employment. To share with you some of um, the success stories, we've actually got this one girl. Her name is Yasmin. She was a recent Accelerate graduate. Um, she started her very own DIY kit um, startup, whereby she sells this DIY body painting and DIY the paintings and all sorts and actually sell it for people to buy and then her business now is is, is expanding and it's flourishing um and and that's just one example we've got another uh, b40 youth in sarawak that we've worked with his name is marks and i remember he started selling inflatable swimming pool in the first mcr and he's richer than me i think now because in the program he made 5,000 ringgit just by selling them. <laughs> so I guess I just wanted to share some of the stories and some of the beneficiaries that we've worked with at Accelerate Global. But yeah, yeah, that, 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 uh, sure. that success stories, I, I think that is what we, we need and they need to be shared out. Obviously, people want themselves to be made known. You have all the social media cha uh, uh, channels out there. It's just just that that that, that uh, the, the narrative has to be good and have to be easily understand. So they they can also build in the, inside them that hey, they can do it. I can do it. Yeah, I can I can get out of my comfort zone and and do something something that. Perhaps, like you mentioned, maybe obtain like ten thousand or, or twenty thousand per month if that's their end goal. So that's just my humble opinion, sir. No, yeah, absolutely. I think I completely agree with you in terms of the optics and having their story heard. That's very, very vital. I just wanted to see if the other panelists have anything to chip in. No, no, yes, no. Oh, I see nobody unmuting. So, okay, that's okay. So I guess I've chipped in and I hope that's enough. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So anyone else have got anything to say, feel free to unmute yourself. But there is a question here um, that I actually wanted to bring forward. Oh, OK. It's not. Here. Oh, there you go. Um, again, it's actually from Fatah as well uh, in terms of our current value system is actually limiting uh, us from showing or expressing our opinions um, in terms of oppression on freedom of speech that has resulted in such negativity out there. I have a personal opinion on this. But I'm going to let the panelists speak about this first, and then I'll round it up at the end. Um, maybe Sun Singh, do you want to lead on this? I know TFM is really loud in what you guys are doing. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So like I said at the very beginning, right, part of our student vision is to see students with, with voice, right? And, uh, and I think, you know, that's a tricky thing in, in Malaysia, right? We're a very young democracy. We're a very young country. And I think, you know, the process of democracy is about finding our way through making, uh, through being uh, in, in becoming a society in which everyone has a voice that can be represented in some way, but us then choosing our path uh, forward as, as a nation. So it is very tricky, right? And I think that, I think a challenge that, that we see is that, you know, in order for us to progress, we need young people who are creative. We need young people who are problem solvers. We need young people who are critical thinkers um, in order to enable problem solving and creativity. But a challenge that we've seen, which Adriana brought up in the chat, is that oftentimes our education system teaches you um, uh, what to think, not how to think, right? We're not teaching kids the skills to uh, analyze situations, to take different perspectives, to see the other side of an argument. Um, but we're teaching them that if this is the question, this is the way that you should answer it. Even if we think about the, the, uh, the way in which we teach values, um, for those of you that have gone through moral education, 
These are the 32 values that we believe as Malaysians. Don't question why we have these values. Memorize these values and regurgitate it on an examination, and you will therefore pass or get an A in moral. But it doesn't really test whether you've internalized or you truly believe those values or you have a why as to why uh, those values mean something to you. And you know, the Ministry of Education has really been pushing for how do we, uh, and so the term is hot, higher order thinking skills. How do we develop hots uh, in our students? But someone also said this in the chat as well, right? In order to develop hots in our students, we need to develop that in our teachers. And I think that the empowerment then needs to come across um, from, uh, from at every level. And so teachers are terrified to express their opinion because they know that if they say or complain um, that they're gonna get rung up or they're gonna get, uh, there's gonna be action taken against them if they complain about something. And then, and that trickles down across uh, across the board. And so we need to, uh, when we think about um, how do we, you know, have this dialogue, this individual community national dialogue uh, about what our values mean to us, we need to create that space um, for differing opinions to, to emerge and be able to navigate the tensions and the discomforts of that. But it really, really does start, I think if we're thinking about what this means for us as a nation, it really, really does start of how do we build the capacities uh, in, in our teachers to be able to facilitate uh, that learning process um, for our students. And so, you know, when we, when we do all of the student leadership things and uh, we use a design thinking process and it's all about the students coming up with the creative medium problems. And it's very, very, it's very, very interesting because we have to like the, the piece, you know, when you talk to Malaysian students and you tell them that no idea, there's no right or wrong. Um, every idea at the brainstorming stage, every idea is acceptable, right? And that's like, oh, but what is the right answer, right? And so we need to shift away from that. There is no right answer, right? People will have different values. People will have different beliefs. But our role is, as, as a society is to reconcile those things and find a way forward uh, with that. So how do we then encourage our young people to do that? And, you know, I think our Malaysian young people have been extremely brave during this period of time, right? We've seen, uh, and it's been mentioned in the chat, right? We've seen the voice of young people rise. We've seen oppression come on the other side and young people hold their ground around it. But then I think we, that's where we need to see that uh, that reconciliation as, as what Pancharine said, right? It's a two-way uh, it's a two -way street. And just because young people are expressing their voice doesn't mean they're right all the time, right? But we need that voice to be allowed to be heard in order to then find a way forward uh, that works for all of us. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The, the reconciliation, um, and I really like how you mentioned about the fact that the youth is now are see, you know are already brave because we are seeing a lot of um, youth who are starting to speak up, who are starting to actually bring forth the issues that are meant to be discussed at the moment that are very very timely. So kudos to them. Actually, I think that's something that we definitely um, should highlight. Now, just to wrap it up, I'm I'm looking at the time. I think Pao has I, like sorry, Rauda, to interrupt. Can I just add to Sun Singh's point? Yes. Uh, schools are important. Yes, we need to build capacity, but it's an all-society approach. Parents who are in the house with the child, with the youth, need to also reinforce, right? So we can't just abdicate and say, okay, it all needs to happen in school. These teachers need to learn it, whatever, whatever. Us as parents, you know, sisters, brothers, siblings, we got to also do that. So yeah. it, 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 yeah. it's, it's a combination. Absolutely, absolutely. It, I mean, everything, everyone has a part to play a play with actually in 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 uh, in, in in championing youth empowerment perfect okay just to round it up i have one last question for all panelists perhaps we can keep it to one minute to two minutes um and this is that this question is actually dedicated to the youth that's out there who are listening and um, who are tuning in and who actually wants to start contributing to either to the nation to the corporate to any any of the sectors that they are in what is the one advice that you can give to them to forge through, pursue their dreams, go forward and actually make an impact. I'm gonna start with Juan Shireen first, the wise, the most wise here, I believe. So let's start with Juan and then, and then we'll go down the line. <laughs> Not necessarily so, Rauda. I think everybody is 
wise and, and have uh, you know contributed so much to this discussion it's very rich and thank you we're documenting all the points and also we're recording this session because at the end of the day it helps us as an organization as an data to design the programs that's you know uh relevant suited has got the right kind of um impact that we want to create together uh so uh, you know to wrap up um i think there is um we've, we've come a long way uh i do see that because you know, when I was uh, a lot younger, there wasn't that many uh, youth organizations that I could be part of. It would only be school, uh, clubs and schools. Now we really see youth based and youth organizations that are managed, driven, led by youth. So that's fantastic. But of course, there's a lot more that we need to do. So my 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 end point is that it's it's still an all society approach, build capacity of everybody involved in that uh, around that community, to to then you know um, support uh, our 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 young ones and empower them, uh, because they are going to be the next generation anyway. So we need to invest in them in them. We need to invest in them in 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 a bigger way, and and everybody needs to play a role, not just government. NGOs, people with resources and cap, uh, capital, your corporates and all that, uh, we need to put a lot of this behind uh, youth and youth who are doing the right things. Thank you, Point. Mahmoud, shall you. we go to you? Yeah, a um, few years back when, when Isha Faisal and I started eColony, at that time because I was a GM and I don't know how to handle a business. So um, we, we, we don't have the resources. We don't know what we're going to talk about, with what the end goal of the colony. But what I know is people, people have their own experience. They, they have their own uh, good practices. So that's why we started the colony. And um, instead of you know, invite and pay guests, what we did was uh, we invite a guest to share their experiences and good practices. And as a return, the, the participants uh, as a return. So at the end of the session, the, the, the speaker will uh, was able to give uh, a challenges that they're facing. And then we get the participants to brainstorm and help to give more suggestions on how the, 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 the presenter can you know, overcome the challenges that they're having. And that, that's one of the things. So you know, go out, just you know, do it, and things will come better and easier as you go along and as you move forward. Super, absolutely. Thank you, Harvina. Um, I'm, I'm just going to keep my advice simple. Uh, much like the Nike slogan, I would say just, just do it. So uh, any youth out there, if you are keen on, if there is a certain issue that you are keen on, you're keen to contribute to, so, you know, maybe it's uh, only 18 or something like that, just Find find whatever organization that it that is currently uh that's currently working towards uh fulfill the, fulfilling that goal and you know just raise your hand and say hey I I I'd like to help out can I do this or if you want to start your own organization you want to be a self starter just do it that's the best that that is the best way to fulfill you know your 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 own potential and to uh fulfill those those that leadership potential that you might have just just go out there and do it be, be a self-starter that's the best uh, advice that i can give to you absolutely i resonate with that a hundred percent yeah i think you can definitely resonate with that rounder <laughs> <laughs> thank you harvina Singh, one last wrap up from you yeah thanks so much rada you know i think that the there there uh, I agree with Harvina. There are so many opportunities that are available now, and really, like, just just do it and get some. Uh, you know, just take the leap and get something started. But there are also going to be many uh, students who may not have access, or may not have uh, opportunities available, or may not even qualify for them. Right. And I think that when we think about youth empowerment, going back to what Poncharina said at the beginning, it is a two way street, right? And I think that for young people, um, if you have see no avenue ahead of you, the first avenue that um, that you can take is really like, we'll work with the adults that are around you, 
right? And I think that when we look at when we look at um, youth participation, true youth participation isn't just when youth are empowered to do things in uh, all by themselves and be like lone rangers, but true youth participation, the research shows, is when adults and youth partner together to move forward and to, to take action together. And so I would say to young people who are struggling to find an avenue who want to do something, build relationships uh, with the people who are around you. Um, teachers love the kids um, that, you know, are, are, are always, you know, uh, willing to support them and willing to help them. And they're going to open up doors for those kids, right? Um, for your parents, you know, like be the, be the sibling that, you know, is, is there and is always really helpful to the adults that are around. Um, be the person that steps up. And, you know, adults, need to play their role in opening the door but as young people um well <laughs> when i was a young person um uh the more that we build our relationships with those who who do have power um that's where doors will begin to open up for us uh, as well super i'm gonna wrap it up that as an intergenerational collaboration actually working together with multiple different people multiple different individuals um because that's where the benefit comes in because you know at the end of the day what you think might might be different than another individual and that's that's the beauty of it and that's how you can definitely grow thank you so very much panelists for today it's already about 12 45 so i'm gonna wrap it up here it was an interesting interesting conversation we talk about a lot of things so i'm going to wrap it up in three different parts just to summarize everything at the very beginning we talked about what youth empowerment means and every single panelist um, gave their own definition about youth empowerment and and a lot of times it overlaps as to essentially ensuring that the youth is in this country are given a voice that the youth is in this country can pursue their dreams that the youth is in this country are given the necessary resources and support in order for them to stand on their feet. And we heard from Juan Shireen uh, that this is a communal approach. There needs to be a symbiotic relationship where it works both ways. The youthers must take charge, must um, take accountability, but at the same time, there also needs to be um, some changes that perhaps must be done in the system, um, in terms of the system uh, itself. And then we also talk about mentoring. Um, and having that ability to choose who you want as mentors, to be brave enough to speak up and to understand what exactly works for you. And if it doesn't work for you, it is completely all right to say, no, perhaps this is not the time, or perhaps you're just, you know, you'll give value to another person, but not me, thank you very much. So being able to speak up is very, very important and understanding what you want in life is also as equally important. We also talked about digital, sorry, dig, yeah, digital gap as well as the gap that exists um, in the country when it comes to youth empowerment. Hence, it is very, very important for us to also think about the youth as who are perhaps in the rural communities or perhaps even friends of yours who you see need a little bit of help or need a little bit of an encouragement um, for them to push through. And so all of us are catalysts of change. It is vital for us to play our role in championing youth empowerment and encouraging the youth to be the best version of themselves. And just as, as we just discussed earlier, a little bit of a, a roundup there to the youths out there who are listening to this, who are tuning in. Remember that all of you are definitely capable to create change. All of you are capable to be a part of nation building. All of you are unique in your own ways. You have the capability, you have the potential. So go forth, forge, and just be who you are and create change in this country. You have me, you have Sun Singh, you have Harvina, Mahmoud, Puan, Sharin, Pao, and the whole of your essence of team to support you. And with that, I'll wrap it up for the webinar today. I'll see you guys in two weeks for the next one. Have a good Saturday, everyone. Stay safe and stay at home if possible. Take care, everybody. Care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. How would you like to share what's our next uh, edition? Because that's what we do traditionally at the end of it. Oh, yeah. Well, while um, people are saying their goodbyes. All right. Uh, so for the next uh, <laughs> webinar, we'll be touching upon the subject of uh, what organizations can do to achieve